Good morning. Well, I'm glad you showed up. Can you imagine how ridiculous this would be if I sat here and did all this and talked to people and there was nobody listening? So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before you try to figure this out, I'm going to tell you we've got a, a new setting. We're taking this program on the road and we're trying to uh, add a little twist that will improve things and help you. But I'm certainly glad all of you are here. And uh, God bless you. We're going to pray in just a moment. And we're going to give some folks a little time to catch up. I've got a skeleton crew here with me, helping me. But they don't look like skeletons. They're, they're doing great. I have several things I want to share with you. And I often think when I say that, I should say it two or three times during our session together because most people don't get it at first. I'm asking my friends who, who uh, direct this when people come on. And so many people try to be on when we start. But every episode is archived. We have 130 of those archived now, and you'll be able to see what's in the broadcast and sometimes get to the one thing that you need help with. My desire, my desire is to try to help you do a more effective, more better, a better job for the Lord's work and for the Lord's people. And so I want to be as helpful as possible. I'm dealing with a subject on the preparation for the greatest year in your life in ministry. And with some principal things, I hope will be a great help to you. But will you pray with me, please? Let's ask God to work in this session. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ, that we're not all bound up. And I, I pray that you'll bring the message through that we need. Help us as we seek to follow after thee. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would imagine, since the Lord said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, I would imagine there are certain things that ought to characterize every New Testament church. And so we ought to say, here are the things we can count on. These things are true. No matter where you go, if we're following the Lord and we're seeking to be the church, that the Lord Jesus started, there are certain things that ought to be true of that church. Always the world, the flesh, and the devil are trying to distract us. So, but each, each church is a reflection of their pastor, especially if he's been there a while. I've been in the ministry going on 56 years, and at this church, moving on 35 years in this one locale. We should talk sometime about how having a long ministry because you ought to stay, plan to stay, and what's it like to preach, <laughs> preach to, the, to a crowd of people and uh, all the way through. By the way, Dean, I see you coming on, and Dean, we're praying for your wife praying that God will work in her life and work in your life with what you're dealing with. Thank you for your encouragement. Let me read some things to you from the Word of God and share some things I think will be a great help to you. If we're going to do God's work, we need to do it God's way. And we need to place the emphasis 
where the Lord's placed the emphasis. And life is a matter of emphasis, saying these are the things we believe that God has put his finger on that the Lord wants. So we're doing all we can to follow the Lord in these issues. Sometimes people say, well, if I know it works, I'll try to do it, making sure we're doing the things at work. I want you to rid yourself of that. If it's what God wants, if it's right in the eyes of God, and if it's true of the Bible, that's what we ought to do. And we trust the Lord to do the work that only he can do. And he can do exceeding abundantly above all we ever ask or think. So in everything we do, may God give me liberty. In, in everything we do, we ought to follow Christ's example. For example, <laughs> uh, how did the Lord do his work? How did he get it done? The Bible says in Mark in chapter 3, and I want you to write this verse down. In Mark chapter 3 and verses, uh, verse 14, the Bible says, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. So the first call on all of us is to be with the Lord. I said the topic I'm dealing with is how to prepare for the greatest year in your life and ministry, how to be prepared for that. And so the foundation must be placed so that we can build on that foundation. And sometimes it takes a re-examining of what you're doing. Uh, years ago, I knew a pastor. He said, I've been in a long ministry. He'd been in the ministry over 50 years. And he said, I've tried years ago to keep carrying with me everything I added to what I was doing. And I found out that I could not just keep adding to and adding to and adding to. I had to eliminate some things. And so that's what we find in our lives too. Some things we just, we say, well, look, I, I did that years ago, but maybe that's not what I need to do now. I'll not emphasize that the way I do now. So Jesus calls us to be with him. And then he sends us forth to preach. And he's called you to be with him. Are you conscious of that? that I'm laboring together with the Lord. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So everybody in the ministry doing the God's work, everybody in the Lord's work should be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's something we work on all the time. And may God guide us to help us. Let me read the verse again. Make sure you write it down. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 14. And you ordained 12 that they should be with him. And they might send them forth to preach. Now, every one of us needs to follow the Lord's example. You find the same thing true all through the word of God. When you come to what Paul wrote in his final words to his son in the ministry, Timothy. I want you to listen and remember now what I just read. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said to Timothy, in the pattern that all of us ought to follow, you ought to follow, I ought to follow. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, There therefore, my son, be strong in the grace as in Christ Jesus. And here's the verse, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's exactly what the Lord did. 
That's what Paul continued to do. That's what he instructed Timothy to do. That we have to get from God what God wants us to have and then impart that to others. So if you're trying to lead your church, who are you leading? Jesus said he called 12 to be with him, thoroughly with him. He spent time with them. He talked to them. He taught them as he, as he ministered. He developed this intimacy with them. And I say there's two things that happened. They became keenly aware of his purpose, what he was here for. And then they began to get his passion. And so that's what we need. I was with a, an able pastor yesterday, and we were talking about young preachers. And he said he travels and speaks in lots of churches and uh, to state what he stated, where I go and ask those young preachers, what would you like me to do? What would you like me to help you do? And very few of them even know, have any idea specifically what God wants them to do. So um, how are we going to do God's work? When Dr. Robertson was still alive, and I saw him often, talked to him often, at one juncture after he retired and went on the road to almost entirely preaching other places, he said, Clarence, I've been in 163 churches. And he got very sincere about the thing. He's always sincere, but in a serious tone, he said, I've been in 163 churches, and I wouldn't join one of them. Not one of them would I be a member of. They have no passion. They don't seem to know what God's given them to do. And if we're going to make the most of what we've been assigned, if we're going to have the greatest year in our life in ministry, we have to be more specific than that. And so that's what Jesus teaches us. He chose these men not just to hang around with him, not just to do things, for, but for specific purpose. And from those men and later women, they were imparting the things he imparted to them. When you look at your ministry, look at your church, uh, when I look at the church I pastor, Someone said to me, we have 10,000 members. I'd like to find them all. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, um, no matter how many members you have, or what size church you're dealing with, you're, you're trying to help people do what God has assigned to us. And so, may the Lord help us. I'm preaching through the book of Second Timothy uh, to our people. And we've come now to the fourth chapter where we're charged to preach the word. And so I've given a lot of attention to that word preach. Everybody ought to be preaching the word, but it ought to be coming from people who are growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and maturing. In other words, there may be a lady doing her shopping at the grocery store who's preaching the word. There may be a, a clerical person working somewhere in a business who's preaching the word. Now, I'm, I don't want to make anybody mad, but we're not going to ordain women to be pastors, and we don't believe that's what God's way is. But I believe that women and all people, young people, young adults, all people, the elderly, all people have the responsibility to preach the word and to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. But how do we do that? How do we do that? We do that the same way the Lord Jesus did with his disciples. He didn't come and become a man without ceasing to be God, born in a manger, and then go immediately to the cross. He didn't do that. He chose these people to follow him. 
to be with him, to get his purpose and his passion because he was going back and he wanted to teach them how to do his work in the world. That's still where the emphasis needs to be placed, where we need to do God's work. Oh, I've got so many things I want to say to you. I want to show you this little book. It's not a little. It's, it's a book that I was given years ago, uh, maybe, maybe 50 years ago. This book is 125 years old. This is a recent copy. You can get it in paperback now. But it's The Training of the Twelve by A.B. Simpson. A.B. Bruce, rather. A.B. Simpson is another character, a great one too. But A.B. Bruce, if you don't have this, be careful about buying it. Be careful about getting a copy. I've got a copy that was published way back when it was first, first printed. Uh, this is a copy that's been handed down from generation to generation. But the whole idea is the training of the 12. I think you can see it. I'm going to read to you something from the table of contents. Uh, and so A.B. Bruce was a preacher who determined that he was going to train people the way Jesus trained his disciples. And so uh, the table of contents reflects that. Remember, this was given, I think, first in 1894. But God's word is timeless. The truth is timeless. Uh, today, people would think, well, we've got to do everything imaginable in media. What we're doing with you right now involves media. And I'm glad we have this gift. But the, the message that we have is always the same. If we're declaring God's word, the methods we use are always the same. I want you to write those two words down because I don't, I don't speak to be heard. I'm not just speaking to you to be heard. I hope and pray to God you're going to repeat it to somebody. So you're not going to find a different message. The message is the word of God. It's God's word that equips us, makes us thoroughly furnished to do God's work. And the methods we use, you can't escape uh, searching the scriptures. You can't es escape uh, giving yourself to God's word. You can't escape uh, the, the work of prayer. And uh, you can't escape how the Lord sent two by two. There are biblical methods that are always the things that we ought to do and they ought to remain biblical. Now, the thing that changes is the means, means. Uh, years ago where I'm sitting, not far from where I am, there were civil war battles. As a matter of fact, there was a school about 300 yards from where I'm sitting right now that was destroyed by uh, the Confederate forces and uh, it was established to teach people. But during that time, people didn't have the travel we had. They used different means. They didn't have the, the technology we have. They used different means. And some of the people we read about who were so wonderfully used of God, they didn't have the means, or excuse me, they didn't have the, the means we had. Means do change. I get on a plane, fly somewhere. I get in a car and drive somewhere that I can get someplace in hours. And some of those, some of those destinations would have taken me days. But if I get there, I'm still declaring the same message and I'm still using the same biblical methods to get God's work done and to teach people. It's one person delivering to another person and following the things that God did. And you cannot improve on that. You cannot improve on that. When you look at your church, don't, don't look at the attendance. 
that ought to be a concern, but not your chief concern. When you look at your church, look who is helping you, who's following you, who are the co-laborers with you. Who can declare the message that you declare? Which people and who who are the people that you've imparted the truth to? Because that's the way it ought to be done. That's the way the Lord Jesus did it. And you find the disciples behaving like the Lord. You find the people they trained behaving like the Lord. Uh, the, the Bible says when people got saved in the days of the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Now, where do they get that? They got it from the apostles. Where did the apostles get it? They got it from the Lord Jesus. His doctrine came from God. And the same message was consistently moving through the centuries. And it's gotten to us. Uh, you may have the slickest thing in the world and most beautiful facility imaginable. I told a man the other day, uh, I told other man, a man the other day, you're, you're always going to have somebody building a better auditorium, a bigger auditorium. It's always going to happen. And, but you can't in, improve on what that, what will be done in that auditorium. The Bible says, we're the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, he may have a building with, that seats 2,000 people, but he can't preach any greater message than you preach because God's given it to us. And so we stay true to the Bible in message. We stay true to the Bible in methods. And we, and we use the means that are available to help us to get that message out and to continue those methods. So here, here, are the, here is the table of contents in Bruce's book. I'm just going to read it through. I hope it doesn't bore you. He talked about Jesus and the beginnings, fishers of men. He dealt with the 12, lessons on hearing and seeing. He talked about how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We ought not just pray, but we, we are to teach our church how to pray. You can move along many ways. You can move along by demands you make. You can move along by just expecting people to, uh, to listen to your authoritative voice. Uh, you may say, I've got a great idea. Now, you need to have the same great idea. But we've forgotten some things. We've forgotten the personal work of the Holy Spirit in people's hearts. And we've also forgotten individual soul liberty and conscience we that god created all people to be able to decide when paul wrote to timothy he said continue thou in the things which thou hast learned has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them so continue in the things thou hast learned and has been assured of taught people being teached of being taught by others and they teach others and they teach others and finally somebody teaches the same truth to us now Avery bruce dealt with uh lessons in religious liberty well that's a missing thing i've got a wonderful book that was published years ago on uh our first freedom in a, in america and the declaration of independence and then the Constitution, and then the Constitution had to be ratified. And a Baptist preacher said, we're not going to ratify the Constitution. We're not going to pass the Constitution. And his name was John Leland until it's amended. And so our founding fathers amended the Constitution. They agreed if, if the Constitution was ratified, it'd be amended. Because there were nine states or nine colonies that did not have the freedom they ought to have. Some really uh, were demanding everybody have the same type of worship and that type of thing. Well, a Baptist, one of our Baptist forefathers, recommended that people needed something more than that. 
that we needed freedom. We didn't have, didn't have to have demands upon us because there's individual soul liberty. And so when they finally amended the Constitution, the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Ten Amendments that formed what they call the Bill of Rights, was to guarantee our freedom. That is the very thing the devil and his crowds are attacking now. And I resist that. But now what about you trying to demand your church does a certain thing and does it a certain way? Don't you believe that God is great enough to speak to the people? Don't you believe that God is great enough to convince them that this is God's way, the Bible way, the Holy Spirit can lead them? Sometimes it takes a little more time. But you're giving people the idea that you can pray and believe God. And the Lord Jesus taught his disciples that, which is a precious, precious thing. This, and A.B. A. Bruce continues his lectures on, on this book, and I recommend it to you. He talks about the confession that Peter made, and um, he dealt with the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the first lesson of the cross, the announcement of Christ's death, and how we are to bear the cross. He talked about the transfiguration and the training of the disciples and the things he used to train them, the example of a little child, the example of church discipline, and on it goes. I want you to just take a look at it. Maybe you can get a used copy. Maybe you can get another... Uh, older copy or a used copy that someone's used is not very expensive and not pay the full price for it. But if you've never gotten into A.B. Bruce and the training of the 12, it will give you lots of good things that you could do in training your people to be the church God wants to be. If you could put a measuring rod somewhere in the church and think, is this church as thorough as God wants it? Are we doing what God wants done? The fact of the matter is, look through the whole membership. What do they believe? What have you taught them? You've invested your life in it. What have you put into them? And so you're building the foundation because there is a great work to be done. Before it can be extended, that's what has to happen. I hope you've read Oswald Chambers' Our Oswald Sanders spiritual leadership. And uh, I hope you have an old copy of it because I don't like the revision some, someone's made in the newest one. And uh, I'm an authorized version man myself, and I have a reason for that. And if you don't have that fixed in your mind, you need to get it fixed in your mind. If, if you haven't never, if have never introduced your people to the Trinitarian Bible Society, They've got one little booklet I think I've told you about before. It's only about a dollar. It's, it's entitled, The Lord Gave His Word. And when the Lord gave His Word, and they, they emphasize why we still use, and they've done it for over 100 years in the Trinitarian Bible Society, why we still use an English-speaking language, the authorized King James Version of the Bible. And I, I love the little book that I enjoy it. And I've given it all our families and our church so, so they can deal with the attacks on Scripture. Let me read something to you. One, one chapter and part of a chapter in Oswald Sanders' book is from a missionary leader who, who followed some of the great missionary leaders. This sounds like a letter that Hudson Taylor wrote. It's on fatigue, tired. You ever get tired? You ever get weary? The Bible says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But the secretary of the Church Missionary Society, Douglas Thornton, wrote this. I am weary. I have only written because I am too weary 
to be working now. I'm too tired to sleep. I'm getting prematurely old. They tell me and the doctors do not give me long to live unless the strain is eased a bit. My wife is wearier than I am. She needs complete rest for a while. Oh, that the church and churches at home would but realize one half of the opportunities of today. Will no one hear the call? Please do your best to help us. We're weary. And so I think sometimes we've forgotten the strain of the people. And we're trying to do these things, move forward, but we're weary. Dr. Vance Havner used to talk a lot about come apart for rest before you come apart. So I'm going to give you a little idea here, and I want you to think about it. I, I'm telling you, you don't have to do everything I do or anything I do. Not at all. But I believe that routine will help you. If you want to have the greatest year of your life and the greatest year of your ministry, I believe routine will help you. I have a routine about getting out of bed. I have a routine about going to bed. I have a routine about what I will not talk about after a certain time at night with my wife or anybody else because I have to have, have sleep and rest. I have a routine about getting up in the morning. I should maybe give that to you, but I'm just giving you the idea. I have goals and objectives about that routine, about what I'll do with God and God's word. And uh, when we have a week given to us, the first day of the week is the Lord's day. And coming out of the Lord's day ought to be all the things we need for the rest of the 168 hours in the whole week, but for the rest of the hours that we're tackling, we need the refreshing and spiritual nourishment that we get from the Lord's day. That's why it's so important not to lose the Lord's day. I have a routine about what I will do and what I will not do. I'm saying again, I feel like I, I feel a little bad saying you this is what I do, but I think maybe it'll just help you think about what maybe you ought to do. I, I have some things I will never do on Saturday night. Some places I will never go. I will not I spend my energy on Saturday late unless it's some emergency I have to deal with because I'm preparing all of my life, my body, my mind, my thinking. I'm not talking about as a preacher, but to get everything I can from God on the Lord's day. Now, when I say that, I've taught our people that. I've taught our people about we can pray together, even though we may be in many locations, and we are, we can pray together about things on certain days and and talking about media and means um we have a way to communicate with people with prayer requests we've taken the time to get everyone's uh email and we can send a message to them sometimes there's a need for urgent prayer i'm not going to embarrass anybody but there's people who've had had emergencies in life or news about their children. There ought to be a group of people, when you hear about that, you don't just think, well, this is a bad thing. This is a hurtful thing. You ought to think immediately, there's a group of people who will pray with me about this. Years ago, when I was preaching a revival meeting for Ian Paisley, I was there a number of times, and they were always under peril, always under the threat. I saw a part of his house, I think I told you once, that was blown off by the people trying to kill him. I had a meal in, a, in, a, in one of his associates' homes where there were bullet holes everywhere. And they said to me, we always 
ought to be praying. But there's certain, certain times for intense prayer, even emergency praying, calling out to God. And so they had taken the time to organize their people where they would get the message, this is one of those times. And I don't think they abused that, but this is one of those times we have urgent prayer, a need for urgent prayer. And uh, But you can't do that. You're never going to be able to do that. If like A.B. Bruce, you haven't taught your people what Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. So, and you know, every church is a school. Not every church has a school, but every church is a school. And we're always teaching people, giving them something, always teaching. And if you say, I'm going to have the greatest year in this ministry, I've asked God for four miracle years ahead of us. Four miracle years. I've asked our people to pray. And uh, you say, well, what are you talking about? Buying things or building things? No, I'm talking about miraculous things in the lives of people. People coming to the Lord. People coming back to the Lord. Uh, people begin to live the life that God has designed for them to live and uh, find their full God-given ability miraculous things and that ought to be done but anyway back to the routine and there's routines about the day we do what we do on the day there's routines about the calendar year and um, think about it we have january february march april may june july august september october november december and we have an opportunity for new beginnings. George Sweeting, one of my dear friends, is nearly 100 years old, one of the most visionary men I ever knew in my life. He was president of the Moody Bible Institute for years, and pastor of the Baptist Avenue Baptist Church before I ever got there. He, I was pastor in the um, 80s, 1980s. He was pastor in the 60s of the same church, so he and I got to be friends over that. But George Sweeting always said, the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. And so what this does for your church, for your life, for your family, we give you an opportunity for new beginnings, new beginnings. And you have that almost every week. But every year we have a men's meeting. We have it to start the year because I want to organize all of our men and challenge all of our men with specific goals and objectives that line up with the Bible about what God wants us to do. And I have to know what those things are and know what a church should be doing, how a church should be functioning before I can do that. But our people know we organize our men. Now, when we started doing that, we had a handful of men. But they were men that I was close to and men who wanted to serve God I'm not talking about staff. I'm not talking about people who are paid to do things, but just the men in our church. And so in that men's meeting, um, we, we have a banquet to kick off the thing. You can do it any way you want to. I'm just saying it's, this is our idea. And we have people lining up people to come to the men's meeting. Uh, we have a series of meetings on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And we have them lined up to invite people. We organize a men's choir for emphasis. Remember, we reap a harvest from where we place an emphasis. If you want to see good godly men serving the Lord, uh, you need to have good godly men involved. And they'll, they'll create an atmosphere in a way that other men will serve the Lord. So, and we find the young men involved in that, the single men involved in that, single adults involved in that, young married couples involved in that. We have a men's choir, and we'll have 150 men in the men's choir. And they don't all sing in the choir all the time, but it gives an emphasis to that. So it gives a refreshing breath to our church to give this emphasis and to do it the first of the year when people are thinking about new beginnings 
and the way things ought to be done. We emphasize things with couples in February. You don't have to do that, but we have a couples conference and uh, people work on that. And I don't do it, but I've trained other people to do it. And God help us, that's the way it ought to be done. And we go through the whole year that way. And there are things done in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And the, the seasonal things work in that, but you're organizing your church with a certain emphasis. And uh, I believe that there's long-term and short-term value in that. Even the Lord Jesus sent his disciples out. He sent 70 out on a short-term mission trip, and he had them come back and report to him. Well, sometimes what we do, we, we just say, well, you know you ought to do it, and it's the thing every good Christian is doing, and, but it's, it's good to have a certain project to have them do, get involved in things. And, uh, but you've trained and prepared them to be able to do that. God help us. So keep working at it. Uh, sometime, maybe if you wish, I'll talk to you more about how to plan a whole year's calendar. And some people, I get, get ridiculous about it. Uh, to, we're just giving people opportunity to serve the Lord. And, and I'd be happy to do that sometime. But I want to show you something else I think is of great value. If you have your Bible, you can look at the, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 24. This is vital to me, and it's something that I didn't discover till later in life. As I said, I've been in the ministry going on 56 years, and I, I, I kept thinking there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. Why can't the people get this? Why can't the people understand this? Am I just speaking to a, a wall? But when you get to Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection of Jesus, and that's where we look at the Lord, not just his birth and his sinless life, his death, his resurrection, his, his time after 40 days with his disciples, but his ascension, and what we have from his ascension, where the man Christ Jesus <clears throat> ever lived to make intercession for us. But this, after his resurrection, as he began to spend that 40 days with his disciples, he said to his disciples in verse 44 of Luke chapter 24, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet yet with you, <clears throat> that all <clears throat> things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then, then this powerful verse in verse 45 says, then opened he their understanding. You know, many times the pastor hasn't had his understanding opened. And certainly, many people in the church have done, had their understanding open. But Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You see, the Lord does that by the work of His Holy Spirit. We are always trying to do something for God here, and many things going on. Somebody says it's like a uh, a man trying to spin many plates on many things, keep them all going at the same time. No, no. And I understand something. I'm not going to get anything done here. Somebody said to me yesterday, where'd all these dormitories come from and all these buildings and, and all, all these things? They didn't come from me. I may have, gave them, I may have given them the idea Uh, I may have initiated something, but the Spirit of God has to work in people's hearts and give them an understanding. 
before they'll sacrifice of their time and money and family and and uh, and help us get it done. They come on board and they believe this ought to be done. They God gives them the understanding. Now you may think you're a little bored with me saying this, but the fact of the matter is you're beating your head against a wall and trying to get people to do something they're not interested in doing until the Spirit of God gives them that understanding. It's real. And he gave his disciples that understanding. He opened their eyes. And once a person really has their eyes open, man or woman, young person, whomever, and they understand God's work, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, the Holy Spirit's work, working in their lives. Once they understand that, it's not just like you're doing your best human effort to get it done. There's a different motive, a different one honored, a different goal, different objectives. You know, there are, there are short-term goals and long-term goals. And the short-term goals many times are things to do. For the long-term goal, things to be. And sometimes you hope that the short-term goals accumulated produce the long-term goal the to do things, the to be things. But people don't put it together. They don't understand. They, they don't understand in the natural man how digging in the word of God, the uninterrupted teaching and preaching of the word of God will produce certain things in their lives. They don't, they don't put that together. Um, they don't understand the cross and the crown. They don't, the, the Lord has to put those things together. It's, I don't know any other way to say it. And you want to have the greatest year of your life in ministry is when you begin to see those things when God puts them together and the people understand. Um, and that's the passion of my heart. You know, someone sent me an email recently and said, my pastor was talking like you. And I thought, what in the world are they talking about? And they said, they wrote me a little note in the email. And somebody I have great respect for said, the pastor said, the only real hope of the world is in local churches. Now, you, you have to process that. But you see, people don't understand that. They want the president to get right with God. I want... They want, they want something like that, something dynamic like that to happen. Some big explosion. It's about as silly as thinking you can build a church with big days. It's, it's great to have a big day every once in a while. But that's not the way it's done. Your life doesn't develop that way. I'm the cumulative total of 74 years. And I'm learning things now and more things added to that. That that are keep that keep coming, and uh, I, I'm enjoying my life. I'm I, I don't have the the bigger that I once had, but I have more of the mind of Christ than I once had, and so God's given me that understanding. I'm trying to help you. Now I've got some very precious people with me, and. Uh, I want to talk about two or three things before we're, before we're not able to talk. But I want to give you a little word about our faithful men's meeting. I have a, I have a flyer about it here. A faithful men's meeting, have compassion, making a difference. It takes place Sunday, January 29th through Wednesday, February the 1st. Um, the life of faith and courage. And it's kicked off with a faithful men's banquet. The way we get over 2,000 men to come to that is we seat 10 people at a table. 
and we we don't get we don't get 2,000, 2,100, 2,200 people to come. We don't get them to come, but we get 220 people committed to fill the tables. And we get 10 people to get those other 200 people. That's the way it happens. Where did you learn that? Well, I took this course at a great college in no, Baloney. I read the Bible. That's the way Jesus did it. And one of the great examples is when he fed, fed the 5,000, he, he gave his disciples responsibility. He gave the miracle, gave the bread, and they were delivering to them what he provided. And that's all we're doing. That's all we're ever doing. And so, what we're going to ask those men to do. We're going to ask them to do the thing that God will have them to do with their life. And we're going to try to be specific about it. I believe that every year could be the greatest year we've ever had. Because I don't consider the greatest year to be measured by the greatest attendance, the greatest number of people saved, the greatest number of people baptized. Uh, no, no, no. I consider the greatest year a great year in any individual's life in this church where that person has had his understanding or her understanding open by the Lord and they're doing the things God wants them to do. And I'm serious about that. And I'm happy, more than satisfied with it. James, you want to make an announcement or two here and give me a break? We're very thankful that you joined us for the Shepherd Summit today, and we have some exciting things that are happening we want you to be aware of, to pray about, and if you're in the area of Georgia, Pastor Sexton will be speaking very soon at the Liberty Baptist Church in Lyons, Georgia, with Pastor Michael Plowman and his family that'll be there. That's next Tuesday, December the 13th, and we'd like for you to, if you're in that area of Georgia, to come and attend and be with Pastor Sexton and the Plowmans for their Pastors and Family Day. And if you'd like to have more information about the times of the services and all that's happening there, you can go to that uh, website for Liberty Baptist Church. It's lbclions.org, lbclyons.org. Pastor Sexton has written a new book, and I hope you have it. But if you don't, I hope you'll order it today. It's entitled Before It's Too Late. And it's a great book. In fact, not only the full-length book, but the entire Sunday School series that we're using currently at the Temple Baptist Church. And it's been a huge help. It is a book about the Lamentations of Jeremiah. This past Sunday, someone in the Sunday School class came to me and said, you know, I'm so grateful for this series because I've never really studied the book of Lamentations before, and it's been so helpful for me and for my family, the man said, to understand what God is doing in the book of Lamentations and how it applies to the United States and how it applies to my country and my family and where I work. And so I hope you'll take the time to get this, a wonderful series for Sunday school, and it goes an entire quarter, 13 lessons, and I hope you'll order that. It's a great help, a serious, sobering look at what God is doing in this world and I hope you'll take the time to order that. You can go to faithforthefamily.com and order that book. You can order the full-length book, the entire Sunday School series, and we're very thankful uh, for this opportunity to let you know about that. And then there'll be classes offered on Crown Global beginning on January the 9th. So in just a few days, if you'd like to take an online course, you can do it entirely online. And one of the classes that is being offered is Paul's Epistle to the Romans an in-depth study of the book of Romans. I hope you'll take the time to go to thecrowncollege.edu and find there those courses that will be offered, not only Romans, but other courses as well. And I hope you'll take the time to do that, increase your understanding of the word of God. And we're grateful that you've joined us again today. And we're praying the Lord would bless you and help you throughout the month of December as you prepare for the Christmas season. May God bless you. And we're thankful for you joining today. Uh, let me take these closing moments 
to do two things, to answer some questions quickly and to make a prayer request. We've heard from Pastor Enrique Juarez and uh, Enrique requests prayer for his family as they make the arrangements for his father's funeral. They're traveling from Texas to California this week. Enrique, we're praying for you. And may God bless you and guide you. Thank you, Pastor. Questions are sent. What do you do to encourage your church at the beginning of the year? Get them involved in God's word. Our people are reading right now the book of the Song of Solomon in preparation for me preaching through that. And I've tried to give them certain goals. Get them to look forward. Keep, just keep looking forward. There are many things we can do. I've given them some other things I hope that will help them in their prayer life. Uh, do you plan a preaching calendar? Yes, I do. And uh, I don't know about anyone else. No one else, as I said, has to do like I do. I was influenced as a young preacher by W.A. Criswell. And Criswell was a man who preached through the Bible. And uh, I've taken all 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament. And I'm trying to preach through every one of them to this church. And I know the handful of books I have left that I haven't preached through. And many times I think I need to go back to that, of course. But, uh, and I put many of those things in print, but all of those things are available through uh, Faith for the Family. And you can find, you may want to, on a certain subject or certain, they're all recorded by text. But, um, and then the books you can get. And I'll help you if you, if you don't, if you're not able to get them, I'll help you get them. But uh, I'm planning, I keep planning and preaching. I'm trying to keep people ahead of it, uh, meaning, meaning they're ready to receive it, ready to hear it. I don't, I don't uh, recommend that you preach some long series uh, because you need to get in and out of something. It may just be three sermons on the subject or whatever. Um, I really enjoyed preaching in, in the first chapter of Luke. Uh, not too awful long ago about the things of certainty, the certainties that didn't preach through the whole gospel according to Luke, but the things that we most certainly believe are most certainly believed among us. And then that's really a, 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 a introduction to the whole book, what you're dealing with about the virgin birth, what you're dealing with the sinless life, what you're dealing about with the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And uh, it helps you too. And I think the greatest thing in preaching is not study. Study is part of it. And, and prayer is part of it. But the part that's neglected is meditation. And so I try to find what I'm preaching on and then point the people toward that. Not, not all of them read it. Not all of them pray. Not all, all of them prepare. But it gives me it gives me time to meditate upon that subject or that passage. And God really speaks to my heart and guides me in that. And I keep things to write notes. We'll have to talk about it at length sometime. I really mean to talk about that. The third question, someone says, what's your advice for young people who are trying to live for the Lord? And uh, I just gave our young people some verses. I call verses to live in, vic in victory. And uh, I want them to have those verses, read those verses. And it's a page here of things. But you're, you're pastoring the church. Listen, if you're pastoring the church, you're helping the people. You're guiding people to God. You're not withdrawn from them. You're part of it. And some people, um, you know, you don't have favorites, I hope. But you do have intimates. I mean, people who want to know more about God, want to know more about how they can do things. I'm writing a book right now on Lord teaches to pray. And I'm doing that because I want to help our people to learn more about prayer. And it's for all people, all people. I'm including that, by the way, including in that one chapter that Dr. Robertson wrote, what happens when we pray. 
with, and Dr. Robertson was the most practical preacher you ever saw in your life. He was criticized by lots of people, but uh, I heard him preach over a thousand times. And that's not an exaggeration more than that, but I, I'm just saying I had heard him preach over a thousand times and I never heard him fire blank, never. And maybe one reason for that is because I loved him so, but he helped me. So the next summit I want you to write down is in January the 3rd to help us get started in the new year, January 3rd. But I want you to be planning this year. Ask, ask God to help you plan 2023. And uh, find a good Bible study. Jump on somewhere where you're going to preach for 2023. And prepare your heart and start preparing the people's heart with expecting great things from God expecting great things from God. We have a, a lot of things going on, of course, always, but one of the things, we're trying to raise $10 million, and uh, we've got a little program called 10 Million and Me. 10 Million and Me. What is your part in the 10 million? We have some very kind people in a trust who are going to match 5 million if we'll raise 5 million. And so we're trying to raise our part of it for $5 million and people who believe in what we're trying to do with Crown College are going to try, are going to match $5 million. But it's a great time to serve the Lord. Remember this, a new beginning will be this to God. And so I hope that you'll plan your calendar, pray about your church, and ask God to really use this in your life. I hope this is helpful to you. Let me hear from you. And uh, I'd like to send you a copy, that's all, a copy of all the booklets I have called Solid Answer Booklets. I think, Ryan, I guess there's over 40 of them now. 36, close to 40. We've got to get to work, don't we? Uh, so anyway, I'll send you a copy that are available. And you may find something that you want to give your people. And uh, it might be anything from... Well, I won't say because that'll be the one you want, but I'll send you a copy and you you can pick which ones you want. I'll try to get them to you. If you'll send me an email, say I'd like to have that copy of all the solid answer booklets that are available. I'd be happy to do that to you. And by the way, I want you, if you've never gotten the, this, this magazine, sort of a book magazine, but if you've never gotten this on the local church, uh, it is just full, 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 full of information and helpful things about the local church, the biblical church, the measure of the church, the vision of the church, the church advancing by faith, the pioneer work of the church, what Charles Spurgeon had to say about the church, leadership of the local church, the distinctives of a Baptist church. You know, we're losing those distinctives because we're not emphasizing that we ought to, like we ought to emphasize them. And I'm an independent Baptist by conviction. I believe that I'm free and independent. I think an independent Baptist church is a free church. And thank God for freedom. We have that in the Lord, don't we? But if you've never asked for this, I'll send it to you free. Uh, if you've never asked for this, you have to send your land address so I can get it mailed out to you. But the local church, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, like for you to have it. It'll help you a great deal, especially at this time. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Thank you.